In this video, your goal is, as usual, to think before you code. And this time, you're gonna think about what does the user need from you? And how's he or she going to use the system? Let's start to talk about what are software requirements? So let's start with an example. Let's assume that an airline company is going to lower uh, the cost of having uh, an employee near the check desk in an airport. While achieving this goal, they might have an idea of get getting themselves a terminal that the passengers are going to use to perform self-check in the airport. I'm pretty sure that you have seen such systems in action and maybe you haven't been letting yourself think about these questions. What, in fact, should the system do? And what it should not do? So requirements are just that. They help you answer questions about features that your application must provide. Differently, and much more broadly, they are often defined as anything that determines your design choices. Put it simply, requirements say what should be implemented, and describe system behavior, properties, and attributes. They come in a variety of different names. For example, you might encounter user, software, business, functional or product or project requirements. Most of these have similar meaning, but some are not. For instance, project requirements target your processes, not the end system. Depending on the project's scope and complexity, you might only need a few requirements or you might need hundreds of pages of requirements. The number and type of requirements can also depend on the level of formality the customers want. For example, if you're building an autopilot system for Airbus A340s or you're writing software to control hard pacemakers, your requirements must be unambiguous. This means there are going to be a lot of them. When you start thinking about the system requirements, you typically go top-down and start with asking the customer what they want to achieve with the system. So business requirements are something that describe why the, the organization needs such a system, meaning the goal that the organization uh, intends uh, to achieve with its help. Their main content are the business goals of the organization or a client that order the system. They are typically written down as a, a vision and scope document. User requirements describe goals or tasks that users uh, have to be able to do using this product and uh, the product in turn should you know get them uh, be useful to them so uh, this area of user requirements also involves uh, describing attributes or uh, pro quality uh, attributes that are important to uh, uh, achieve customer satisfaction. Uh, one of the uh, uh, famous ways of representing this kind of information and requirements are the use cases or user stories and also uh, uh, a variety of UML diagrams. Uh, ideally this information uh, is going to be uh, represented by different representatives of the users. User requirements also describe what the user has uh, to be able to do with the system. Functional requirements uh, typically determine what has to be of the product's behavior uh, given the circumstances. They also determine what the developers must create for the users to be able to perform their tasks the user needs in the context of their business requirements. So this uh, interrelation between the three levels of requirements is vital to the success of the project. Commonly, uh, 
functional requirements are uh, written down uh, in the form of a traditional statement having the words shall or must and uh, the business analyst typically writes down functional requirements using a software requirement specification uh, document. Getting back to our introductory airline example, let's assume that an airline would like to uh, reduce uh, their uh, costs for the employees at this check-in desk at the airport by 25%, which is a perfectly valid business goal. So uh, uh, they might have an idea that they want to install a terminal that the passengers may use to perform self-check-in. So this is what the requirements sound at the business level. Um, at the user level, though, things are a little bit different. So for example, uh, they might have a use case uh, that sounds like this. Um, as a passenger, I want to check in for the flight so I could get on board. So this is a formulation of a user requirement in a user story format. So it's important to remember that a lot of projects typically have various classes of users or stakeholders and other participants uh, and their requirements have to be also re revealed. Uh, at the system level though, the very same requirement might sound quite differently. So it might say something like this, the passenger shall be able to print the boarding pass to all flights that he has checked into. Or, if the passenger hasn't specified the preferences regarding the seat, the reservation system ch shall assign a seat automatically. Um, you need to write requirements at different levels in detail because different readers use them in different ways. For example, uh, the readers of the user requirements are not usually concerned with how the system will be implemented and maybe managers who are not interested in the detailed facilities of the system. These may be client managers or system end users and other types of users. Um, the users of the system requirements need to know more precisely what the system will do because they are concerned with how it will support the business processes or because they are involved in the system implementation. For example, engineers or software developers So what is the business value of better software requirements? Even though requirements are important for setting a project's direction, a project can fail at any other stage too. So if you build a flawed design, write bad code or fail to test properly, or even provide incorrect training materials during maintenance, the project can still fail. If any of the links in the development chain fails, the project will fail. Requirement gathering uh, and requirement engineering is the first link in this chain. So it's the first place where you can screw things up badly. And this is how. So uh, gathering requirements, in fact, helps mitigate risks early in the project. And here are some of the risks. So developers are not always paying enough attention into uh, involving uh, users uh, because they probably think that they already know everything about their needs. A business analyst might actually get uh, the requirements wrong and also uh, the uh, which will you know basically result in poor uh, planning and cost evaluation so you got to know something about your requirements and the productivity of your development team so uh, the requirements are going to be changing and growing and uh, during development requirements can change because uh, of the user you know being humans and uh, you know not thinking enough about you know what the system should be like 
and as a result um, the project uh, you know experiences scope creep meaning they uh, they're beyond their uh, predetermined cost and schedule uh, boundaries one of the ambiguity uh, uh, symptoms might be the users can actually interpret the same statement differently another uh, problem could be gold plating requirements which is something that uh, developers add be just because they need that the users will like it uh, in fact uh, a number of products are also uh, intended to be used uh, by a, a number of user groups uh, and they can actually apply different uh, function sets differently and have also different uh, experience in interacting with the, the software a lot of people um, mistakenly think that time that they spend to discuss requirements just basically delaying their release so they suppose that uh, work uh, working with requirements is not going to pay off uh, in fact, uh, well, uh, the time you invest to obtain good requirements are basically always paying off uh, quite a bit. So um, here are some of the uh, uh, pros that you might be getting from uh, you know, gathering and documenting and uh, managing requirements. So uh, less defects in the requirements and in the product you know, less rework a faster development and also a faster release less unused and unnecessary functionality higher of viability less project scope creep less misunderstanding and more organized development higher customer and user um, and also team satisfaction and overall products that do what is expected of them so to sum up this part of the talk so requirements are some coherent enumeration of the system properties and functionality in fact there exist a number of different levels of requirements such as business, user, and system requirements. They're typically written down as a number of standardized requirement documentation, including vision and scope for business requirements, a user requirements doc that is in fact in a free form, and a software requirement specification for a user and system requirements. So let's talk about which types of software requirements we actually have. So um, software requirements are typically organized into two types that are fundamental to the requirement process. So um, there are functional requirements and the goal for functional requirements is to describe the services that the system should provide. So what is the functionality with the, with the system? And also describe how the system should react to particular inputs that the user is able to provide. And also how the system should behave in particular situations. And the second fundamental type of requirements are the non-functional requirements. So these are basically uh, very general constraints on services offered by the system and constraints imposed by development standards and constraints in the development process. And overall, there is an entire hierarchy of um, non-functional requirements that one may uh, encounter. For example, product requirements can specify on cons or constrain the behavior of the software and performance requirements 
that can specify how fast the system must execute and how much memory it requires. There are also organizational requirements uh, derived from policies and procedures in the customers and developers organization, such as operational process requirements and things like that. And also, of course, there are external requirements. So this is a, basically a broad heading that covers all requirements, requirements that are derived from factors external to the system and its development process, such as regulatory requirements or ethical requirements or legislative requirements. So now you have the idea regarding which software requirements there might be, but what they should be actually uh, to become usable. What are their desired qualities? So let us more or less systematically describe what are the qualities of good software requirements. So good requirements are clear, concise and easy to understand. So this means they can't be pumped full of, you know, management speak or florid prose or confusing jargon. To be clear, requirements cannot be vague or ill-defined, so each requirement must state in concrete, no-nonsense terms exactly what it requires. In addition to being clear and concrete, a requirement must be unambiguous. If the requirement is worded so that you, that you can't tell what it requires, then you can't build a system to satisfy it. To this end, you have to try and avoid words such as best or shortest, as they may be confusing to interpret by the designers and architects of the system. A project's requirements must be complete, meaning that they should not contain undefined quantities um, or terms. A requirement must at least provide a reference to a place in document where the quantity is being defined. Project requirements must be consistent with each other. That means not only that they cannot contradict each other, but also uh, that they uh, don't provide so many constraints that the problem is unsolvable. Uh, each requirement uh, also must be self-consistent. So in a complex project, as you might imagine, it's not always obvious if a set of requirements is mutually consistent. When you start working on the project schedule, it's likely you'll need to remove a few nice-to-haves from the design. Uh, uh, you might like to uh, include every feature, but you don't have the time or budget. So something's gotta go, uh, and at this, at this point you need to prioritize the requirements. Right, so you can defer high cost and low priority requirements until a later release. Uh, last but not least, requirements must be verifiable. If you can't verify a requirement, how do you know uh, whether you've met it? Being verifi verifiable means the requirements must be limited and precisely defined. They can be open-ended statements such as process more work orders per hour. Um, so a better requirement would say process at least 100 work orders per hour. So there are functional and non-functional requirements and ideally uh, all of the user and system requirements should be clear, unambiguous, complete and consistent, prioritized and verifiable. So requirement models help you to concept conceptualize the requirements engineering process. The why, what, how model is the simplest of the possible requirements models and sort of a natural one. As you have figured out, requirements must say why a system is needed based on the current and foreseen conditions, which may be internal operations or external market, 
they say what system features will serve and satisfy this purpose, and it must say how the system is to be constructed. So basically, business requirements lay out the project's high-level goals. They explain what the customer hopes to achieve with the project. For example, they might say the project will increase profits by 25% or increase demand and gain a, a 10k new customers. User requ requirements or stakeholder requirements describe how the system will be used by the eventual end users. They often include things like sketches or forms, scripts they, that allow the steps users uh, that show the steps that users will perform, uh, such as use cases and prototypes. They specify what the user needs to accomplish, but not necessarily how the application must accomplish it. Finally, system requirements attempt to answer the how how the system is going to be constructed and function. This also amounts to describing functional and non-functional and also implementation uh, requirements. So what, why and how are the three words that you are going to use with this model? So you define the business need in customer terms and then you define the, the system feature that will serve and satisfy this purpose. And then after all, you basically conceptually define the way uh, the system is going to be constructed and how it's going to uh, guarantee uh, providing these features. One of the most usable models that helps uh, conceptualize the requirements engineering process is the so-called WRSPM model, or it is also often called the reference model. It is a way of looking on the system in order um, to determine what the requirements might be. The reference model starts with concepts of the system being developed and the surrounding environment that the system must operate in. The overlap between the environment and the system is the interface. The model is based on five artifacts belonging either mostly to the system or mostly to the environment. These artifacts are W for world, which is the domain knowledge that provides presumed environmental facts, so anything impacting our system from the environment. R for uh, requirements, uh, that indicate what the customer needs from the system in terms of its effect on the environment. There are also users' language understanding of what the user wants. S for specifications provide just enough information for a software engineer to build a system that satisfies the requirements. So this is how the system will meet these requirements in natural language. P program implements the specification using the programming language and uh, lastly M the machine meaning the hardware or the system with its constraints. The um, WRSPM artifacts are all descriptions of the same system written in various languages each based on its own vocabulary of primitive terms. The model defines visibility relationships uh, so that uh, part of the system is visible to the environment, perhaps in its user interface or file system, and part of the environment is visible to the system, for instance, its uh, stimuli. Uh, we further see that certain entities, these may be states or events or data, belong either to the system or the environment and are controlled by them. At the interface between the environment and the system, some uh, phenomena or some entities exist, and we will denote them E uh, underscore V. Uh, uh, and the rest uh, of these entities uh, that are, are belonging to the environment is hidden from the system. Similarly for the system, S sub V is visible and S sub H is hidden. 
Let's describe a simple version of the patient monitoring system in these terms. The requirement R is a warning system that notifies a nurse if the patient's heartbeat stops. To do this, there is a programming platform, AM, with a sensor to detect sound in the patient's chest, and an actuator that can be programmed, P, to sound a buzzer, based on data received from its sensor. There is also some knowledge of the world, W, which says that there is an, always a nurse close enough to the nurse's station to hear the, buzzer, the buzzer, and that uh, if the patient's heart has stopped, the sound from the patient's chest falls below a threshold for a certain time. The designated terminology falls into four groups. EH, the nurse, and the heartbeat of the uh, patient. This is the part of the environment that is hidden from the system. E sub V, uh, that are sounds from the patient's chest directly measured by the system's sensor. S sub V, which is the buzzer at the nurse's station, and S sub H, that is an internal representation of data from the sensor. The WRSPM model is a way of looking uh, at the system in order to determine what the requirements might be. It helps to identify the difference between a requirement, the user domain information, and the specification. According to WRSPM, requirements must meet their specifications. One of the simple feature prioritization methods is the so-called Moscow method or model. For an example of using the Moscow method, consider a, a graphical editing tool like Inkscape. It allows, allows you to draw line segments, ellipses, polygons, text, and other shapes, and represents each shape you draw as an object that you can later select, move, resize, modify, and delete. As such, you are able to create vector drawings such as diagrams. But here are some of the features uh, such a system may have. So as you might see, there may be quite a few features present and they are very different in nature. So which do we start developing first? And which can wait? Maybe there is something we can omit altogether. So Moscow is a model for requirements prioritization that delineates requirements into four categories. M stands for must. So these are required features that must be included. So they're typically necessary for the project to be considered a success. S are important features that should be included if possible. C indicate desirable features that can be omitted if they won't fit in the schedule, or they can also be pushed back into release 2. And W are completely optional features that the customer uh, have agreed will not be included in the current release. So commonly if a, if a feature isn't a must or should, then its chances of ever being implemented are slim. Let us look at which of these features are a must. So to identify the must requirements, examine each requirement and ask yourself, could that requirement be omitted? Would the program still be usable without that feature? So the application must be able to save and load files. You could build early test versions that couldn't, but it would be unacceptable to users. Similarly, it must ensure the safety of the current drawing, so the users would never forgive if the program uh, basically discarded a complicated drawing without any warning. Uh, the program wouldn't be useful if it didn't draw. The program should probably allow uh, the user to click objects to select them, otherwise the user may as well use MS Paint. Of course, there is little point in selecting an object if you can't do anything with it. 
So the program must let the user at least move and delete the selected objects. To identify the should requirements, examine each of the remaining requirements and ask yourself, does that feature significantly enhance the product? If it were omitted, would users be constantly asking why it wasn't included? Is this feature common in other similar applications? So several requirements that are fairly standard for drawing applications didn't make it to the must category. When drawing new shapes, the user should also indicate the line and fill styles that they must have. That will require specifying colors, at least from a palette. The click and drag selection technique should be included as should be the ability to hold down uh, uh, the control or shift key when making selections and also any decent application should have help and documentation so this also should be included to identify the code requirements examine each of the remaining requirements and ask yourself would that be useful to the user is it something special that other similar applications don't have is this a feature that we should include at some point just not in the first release but maybe in the long term. So these include added selected objects, which is another of the main reasons for allowing the user to select objects. Support for custom colors and transparency would also be nice if time permits. So cutting, copying and pasting for images and selected objects would be useful, so they should be included. To identify the won't requirements Examine the remaining requirements and ask yourself, is this unnecessary, confusing or just plain stupid? For this application, allowing users to export to LaTeX uh, wouldn't be cool, but probably rarely used. For uh, instance, letting the user rearrange palettes and toolbars would be a nice touch, but isn't important. Auto-saving is also a nice touch, but probably unnecessary. So we can look at user requests and conduct service surveys to see if this feature would be worth adding to a future release. So Moscow method is a method of identifying necessary and auxiliary features for a system to have. Uh, if a system if you say about a feature that it uh, uh, must be included, then you typically put it in an in initial release number one. If I say that a feature should be included, this means that uh, it's an important feature and it likely has to be included in release number one or number two, at least. Those are, that are depicted as could are probably desirable features and these can be omitted if they don't fit in the schedule. And won't designates completely optional features. Requirements engineering processes may include several high-level activities. This focus on assessing if the system is useful to the business, feasibility study, discovering requirements, elicitation and analysis, converting this uh, into some standard form, which is specification, and checking that the requirements actually define the system that the customer wants, which is validation. Typically, one may use a process model such as a spiral to develop requirements iteratively, if time permits. So, uh, the output typically represents a number of uh, requirements documents, such as the business re requirements document, the user requirements document, and the software requirements specification, which even has uh, an IEEE approved format. And uh, it's typically an official statement of, of what the user, um, of what the system developers should implement. Generally, it should include both the user requirements for a system and also a detailed specification of the system requirements. After an initial feasibility study, which we omit here, 
The next stage of the requirements engineering process is requirements elicitation and analysis. In this activity, software engineers work with customers and, custom and system end users to find out about the application domain, what services the system should provide, the required performance of the system, hardware constraints, and so on. Sources of information during the requirements discovery phase include documentation, system stakeholders, and specifications of similar systems. You typically interact with stakeholders through interviews and observation, and you also may use scenarios and prototypes to help stakeholders understand what the system will be like. Requirements Analysis includes things like requirements classification and organization, and this activity takes the unstructured collection of requirements groups related requirements and organizes them into coherent clusters. The most common way of grouping requirements is to use a model of the system architecture to identify subsystems and to associate requirements with each subsystem. In practice, requirements engineering and architectural design cannot be completely separate activities. Requirements per prioritization and negotiation um, uh, inevitably, when uh, multiple stakeholders are involved, requirements will conflict. So this activity is concerned with prioritizing re requirements and finding and resolving re requirements conflicts through negotiation. So maybe stakeholders have to meet to resolve differences and agree to compromise. One may uh, use quite a number of approaches of uh, writing down the requirements document. So, natural language has been used to write requirements for software since the beginning of software engineering. It is expressive, intuitive, and universal. An example of such a statement may be, the system shall measure the blood sugar and deliver insulin if required every 10 minutes. However, using nat natural language descriptions may yield confusion if used improperly. Thus, a general goal with it is to minimize misunderstandings. To this and common uh, recommendations include inventing a standard format, using words such as shall or should consistently to distinguish between mandatory and optional requirements, using text highlighting and avoiding jargon. Structured natural language is a way of writing system requirements where the freedom of the requirements writer is limited and all requirements are written in a standard way, in a sort of a tabular manner. So here is an example of a requirement to compute insulin dose. Graphical models supplemented by uh, text annotations are used to define the functional requirements of the system. To this end, UML use case and sequence diagrams are commonly used. Other uh, uh, ways of putting down the requirements include designing description languages and, of course, mathematical specifications. Lastly, what we typically do is we perform validation of requirements. To this end, we perform a series of checks, such as validity checks and others. So validity checks uh, identifies additional or different functions that are required. So systems that have diverse stakeholders with different needs is um, inevitably a compromise across the stakeholder community. Consistency checks uh, ensure that requirements in the document do not conflict. That is, there should be no contradictory constraints or different descriptions of the same system function. Completeness ensures that the requirements documents include statements that define all functions and the constraints intended by the system user. Realism checks uh, use knowledge of the existing technology uh, to check the requirements against uh, the possibility of actually being implemented. So these checks should also take into account uh, the budget and schedule of the system development. Verifiability uh, uh, to reduce the potential for dispute between customer and contractor, so system requirements should always be written so that they are verifiable. This means that you should be able to write a set of tests that can demonstrate that the delivered system meets each specified requirement. 
Some of the techniques that uh, one may use uh, to ensure all of these checks pass is requirements reviews, um, where uh, requirements are analyzed systematically by a team of reviewers who check for errors and inconsistencies, prototyping, uh, which is an approach to validation where an executable model of the system in question is demonstrated to end users and customers and they can experiment with the model and see if it meets their real needs and also test case generation because requirements they should be testable and um, uh, testing requirements as part of the validation process commonly reveals requirements problems um, so um, a number of steps is typically uh, involved in the requirement development process. That is a licitation where we discover the application domain and services the system should provide and hardware constraints and, and such and analysis where we group subsets of requirements together, uh, sort of defragment them and also resolve conflicting requirements. Specification where we actually write them down using some structured approaches and graphical approaches and validation, where we check the requirements actually define the system that the customer really wants.